Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckus join me shortly in our topics this week. It's Edgemore, more or less. Less secrecy in Kansas. More deficit spending in Washington. Plus, of course, roast and toast. But we start with our interview segment and talk about History is Power, a locally produced blog offering insight into the origins of some of today's top news. The blog is the work of Diane Eikhoff and Aaron Barnhart, Mr. and Mrs. Many of you will recall, as do I, Aaron's years of writing about TV and radio at the Kansas City Star. Aaron, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Ruckus. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be back with you, Mike. So uh, your blog is titled History is Power. So why is history power? Because history isn't just something that gets contained in books that we read at our leisure. History, as James Baldwin and others have said, is something we carry around with us. I think Faulkner said it's not even the past. But the idea is that if we don't know our past, we're really shortchanging ourselves in getting all that we need to understand where we came from and plan a better future Lots for us. of people think history began the day they were born. Yes. And, and often don't realize that much more took place before then. And the reason we study history is to understand the past and what the effect will be on the present and the future. We study the past to better understand the present. Talk some about your blog and how it came to be. Well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, my wife, uh, Diane Eikhoff, was the one who really got me uh, into this. When I was still at the Kansas City Star about 20 years ago, she made a pivot and uh, began studying history, and she wrote the first biography of the woman who brought the women's rights movement to Kansas. Her name was Clarinda Nichols, and I helped her edit and publish that work. That's really what got me in, and then when I quit the newspaper uh, uh, about five years ago, uh, we, I went into it full time with her. And this blog is really the outgrowth of the fact that there are more stories to tell than we could possibly write books. And so if we can just even impart uh, a little story um, uh, every day of every week, I could be doing this till I was 100 because, Mike, seriously, there is so much hidden history, so much that was left out of the books that you and I read growing up. And people can get that information on your blog at no charge. Everything is free. Yeah, yeah. Like, like any blog. I mean, I started blogging in the 1990s uh, back on television when uh, people would do a story just about somebody who, wow, look at this. He's giving away stuff on the internet. Now we're all giving it away. Uh, but uh, I, I find that uh, a lot of the people who uh, followed me back then when I was the TV and uh, media critic for the Kansas City Star um, are, are glad to reconnect with me. And in fact, Part of this mission is to cover the best new films, TV shows, and documentaries that help fill in some of the gaps of the history we didn't get. On your blog right now is a story about late night television, and you and I used to talk a lot about uh, late night television, Johnny Carson, and all the others while you were at the Star and I was on radio. Let's talk about a couple of the items on your blog right now. One deals with Black History Month, which of course February is. And you say Kansas City is a site where there is a lot of black yeah. history. Yeah, uh, black history is uh, one of those parts of American history that we, we, we as uh, the establishment, let's put it that way, for many years, uh, almost all major history posts were, were held by whites. Uh, the National Park Service, which is where a lot of the uh, charged with a lot of the historical preservation used to have segregation policies. So we're doing a lot of catching up here. But Kansas City and this entire Missouri-Kansas border region, I'm happy to say, has some of the best interpreted black history sites, whether it's uh, Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka, uh, the George Washington Carver site uh, down by Joplin, uh, or even here in, in Kansas City. In addition to the outstanding Mid-America Black Archives, we've got the Quindaro site. And I'm really excited about the, the symposium that my old colleague, Paul Wensky, is going to be convening in April uh, with all the major uh, stakeholders and storytellers around the Quindaro site. And let's see if we, we can't get that move forward to the next 
to the next stage of historic preservation. We're down to the last minute or so. Uh, you have a story analogizing President Andrew Jackson and the current occupant of the Absolutely. White House. Absolutely. I don't think it's any accident that the current resident of the, <coughs> of the Oval Office has right over his shoulder a portrait of our seventh president. Uh, they were both bold. Uh, they both got completely, they were both uh, never afraid to say what they said. They both had a populist appeal. And the most intriguing thing to me, Mike, is that in their first year of office, they were completely consumed by chaos, and chaos surrounding specifically a scandal involving a woman of uh, uh, ill repute. And these were the kinds of things, I, I wouldn't say that the women who are accusing the current president are necessarily women of ill repute. I would say that the, the, the sex scandal and the chaos and the ability to overwhelm the president, uh, very much like what happened in the first year of Andrew Jackson's terms, and guess what? He righted his ship, uh, went on to win a second term, closed down the Bank of the United States, and moved all the Indians uh, I was west. going to say, and Jackson won a second term. Yes. Very quickly, if somebody wants to see your blog, how do they do that? They go to historyispower.blog, and uh, there uh, they can read the articles and, and sign up for the newsletter, and I'll, and I'll send them a guide of uh, good history films. Aaron, watch. thanks very much. Thanks for coming Thank in. Thank you, Mike. Uh, best regards to Diane. Tell her I said hi. I'll pass it along. All right, that is the creator of History is Power, Aaron Barnhart. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Terry Riley is a former city councilman and now heads Transformation Consultants. Crosby Kemper III is head of the Kansas City Library System and host of KCPT's Meet the Past and Centropolis programs. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant and attorney Steve Marakian offers learned counsel from his large corner office at Worsh, Hobbs, and Marakian. Appreciate all of you coming in. Special thanks to Crosby for filling in at the last minute for Annie Presley, who's a bit under the weather. And we hope Annie gets well and back to the program soon. I'm her cousin Elvis. Elvis, all right. You, uh, good line. Uh, you likely thought that when you heard the city council had finally signed a memorandum of understanding with Edgemore Infrastructure to build a new KCI, it was a done deal. All the talking was over, now the airport gets built. But it's not over. The council's 8-5 to five vote last week simply means discussions with a divided council will continue, aiming for a final contract by September, Jesus. almost one year after voters approved a new airport. Among those who voted for the MOU, Mayor James and council members Fowler, Lucas, Justice, Kennedy, Reed, Shields, and McManus, Voting no, Wagner, Hall, Lohr, Barnes, and Taylor. So first question, you used to be on the city council. Uh, Terry, what's your perspective on how the council is doing with the KCI question? Well, first of all, I'm glad uh, it passed. And to be per uh, perfectly honest, I am a consultant to, the, uh, to Edgemore. And so I just wanted to say that. Uh, I'm glad the council passed. Well, sure, it. you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're right about that. Uh, but uh, just looking at it overall, uh, eight to five. Uh, of course, you're not satisfied with it just being eight to five. As we move along, I would like to bring all those council uh, members on board to create an airport that each council member can be proud of, and 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 subsequently the entire city, can, uh, most of all, the city will be proud of. Was there a consistent reason why five of the council members said no? Uh, there were different reasons. Some of the uh, council members liked other groups uh, uh, that were. Uh, there before. Uh, some council members just believed it shouldn't be an airport. Some council members believed it should have been 100% union. Okay. Uh, Crosby, you were, you, you were not a former councilman, but uh, I'd be interested also in what your perspective is well, on that. I think the whole process handling. has been unbelievably badly managed. Jolie Justice herself said uh, we shouldn't let elected officials conduct these kinds of, uh, no. which is interesting for a person who's probably running for mayor to say, you know, don't let, don't let me do this. One of many. Um, yeah, one of many, and they're all running for mayor, and a lot of the votes were about, about that one way or another. Um, I, you know, who knows at this stage? The city's not been good at managing large projects, with maybe the exception of the Sprint Arena in, uh, in recent history. Every audit uh, shows problems. Um, I'm a little worried as a former banker that our, the, the, the MOU they voted for shows not a $1 billion uh, ticket, it's $3 billion. Everybody should be aware of that over 35 years. And the useful life 
uh, of the airport is much less than 35 years. We'll be doing major renovations while we're still paying for what we're about to do. And so I'm not sure anybody's actually managed this process up to this point. So Mary, uh, there are city elections next year. Will the airport be a major issue, do you think? Sure, and it should be. And I have uh, a somewhat of a different point of view about the, quote, politics involved, Crosby. Uh, I, what, 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 is, what is the matter with people uh, complaining about there being politics with politicians? This is supposed to be a public process. And it's, if, if it's a public process, it's a $1 billion and once-in-a-lifetime project, extraordinarily important for our economy, then of course it's going to have controversy. There better be different points of view. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem, uh, to, and Terry, the, early on, was that it wasn't open. And there were various efforts along the line to make this a more secretive uh, process. Thanks to the Kansas City Star, Catherine Shields. Uh, well, very, some of us on Ruckus who talked about and it. And some of us on Ruckus. Mm -hmm. we, that we began to open the process up. And um, I sharply disagree with Jolie Justice. Public officials need to be in charge of public Event. So, so Steve, uh, some people still say this project should be undertaken by a local company. Do you agree? Well, I thought that all along, and I still believe it. But the problem is, and I think Terry's right, uh, you know, this, this was voted on. The council did these things. And, and where, I, where I agree with Mary to this extent is, uh, is that the politicians, I think, make the initial vote. They decide who they're going to use. It was, it was, it, it, they chose Edmore. That's on them, okay? But from that point, then I'm along lines of, of Crosby. I, I'm a, a lawyer, but I'm also a businessman. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that these council members have the first idea how to build an airport. And they look at these memorandum of understandings and so forth. They look at these things, and they, and they all have their, their own political concerns about it. But the reality is you have selected Edgemore. If Edgemore is not worthy of putting this project together, which they clearly are, okay, then that's on you. But from that point, let them do their job and get this airport built. Well, and the council has over a million dollars worth of outside legal counsel helping them decide if the yeah. contract yeah. and from a, from a, are a development shape. Development exactly. lawyers who've made a lot of money off the city over the years and making a lot of money off this deal. I, mean, I, I will just say that our hope here is that Southwest will actually control this process because ultimately the airlines, which means ultimately the airline passengers are going to pay for this. So I'm hopeful that they'll actually well, oversee this because I don't think that anybody at the city is the, capable of the it. The people who ought to be in charge are the people that represent the people. The purpose of the, you know, what we have to worry about is will the interests of the flying public, the citizens of the city and the, and the region, be foremost? Now, you want the airlines, the answer to, that you is want no. the airlines to make money. Of course, you want them to do well. You want them to come here. Okay. But it's for us. And I that's believe why i got, I got to stop it and move on because we're running short <laughs> on time. From time to time, a word that's been around forever suddenly comes into vogue, and you hear it being said everywhere. The most recent example is transparent, which has nothing to do with changing gender or having children. Transparent simply means clarity and openness. Something you expect from government, but don't always get. The most vivid local example is apparently Kansas State government. The Star has done a lengthy series of news stories, editorials, and public meetings to drive that point home. The new governor, Jeff Collier, apparently got the message. In his first address to the legislature, he announced a series of steps to make Kansas government more open, more transparent. So, Mary, is uh, Governor Collier now on the right path? Absolutely on the right path. It's such a, mm -hmm. it's so much fun to say something great about a Republican. Oh my God! <laughs> it's so odd to hear you I do that. Well, he's no dummy. He wants Shot. to be elected. He doesn't want to be the selected governor. <laughs> and as long as he follows Stephanie Clayton, a Republican uh, from Overland Park, who has distinguished herself on this issue, uh, he'll be just fine. What he has suggested, what he's going to do is. Put a website. So imagine this: governor's office websites of all the agencies of state government will be open. All their meetings will be posted on websites. It doesn't sound very revolutionary, but it is. The second thing that's that's extremely important is that he said he might look at opening up 
the details of development projects. Like HCA moving like, their headquarters like with HCA. huge Kansas subsidies, <laughs> well, HCA, which he works for. Yeah, yeah let, let's quickly, quickly note that HCA is moving from uh, Missouri to Kansas, it right? Uh, Governor Collier, who's a plastic surgeon, does some work at HCA. Oh, he is on their board. Uh, he says he had nothing to do with it. He had no involvement with it. It was done during the Brown back. The day he becomes governor, they announce yeah. the big subsidy and, for the board and, of the yeah. of the and, medical and this, process process. Going on. this is a great example of lack of transparency. This is the taxpayers' money. We don't know how much it is. We, we don't know no what idea. the deal is. And what we do know is that every every analyst of this across the country says Missouri and Kansas are the center of the worst public uh, Steve, policy. Steve, if this is really a problem in Kansas, why has it gone unnoticed for so long? <laughs> well, a, a let, lot of it... Let Steve uh, answer that no, one. No, a, a lot of it has to do with the reality that we all talk about transparency. We all say we're in favor of transparency. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, throughout our political history, there has been virtually no transparency. We know so little about what our government does at all levels that we've, we've essentially come to accept it. And so we continually vote for people based upon ideology, party lines, and so forth and so on, without actually making them accountable. I like what the governor's doing. I'm in favor of maximum transparency to the extent that you can do it without letting the people micromanage. Uh, uh, but, Terry, but, is this but most people, most people really a, don't want to know, and they don't care. Yeah. Uh, is this something that uh, Collier can run on? Uh, the governor who has made transparency part of governing in Kansas? Absolutely. I mean, he, he's saying transparency right <laughs> after a deal that he probably was involved in has been put out there moving HCA from, Can, uh, from Missouri over to Kansas, but now he's saying transparency. One thing I would like to say as it relates to education, that's another piece I would like to, you know, him to continue to push forward as it relates to transparency. And, and, and last, if he really wants to be transparent, just like Crosby said, let's open the book on all of these uh, development Appeals. projects that's been done in the cloak of secrecy. Yeah. And if he's really serious about that, he'll do just that. I and that Terry, will show he's the being big totally deal, Terry, is that to open up the legislative process, believe it or not, ordinary citizens in Kansas couldn't find out who voted for which but bills. They don't in record their all the votes. That's they right. don't record right. the votes. I mean, it's it's amazing. Mary, when you were in the was it Iowa legislature? The Iowa legislature. Uh, was it transparent? I when I was elected in the freshman class of 1972, um, it was a huge issue. And the first thing I took on, and a number of us did, was to open. They had they had secret committee meetings back then. But that my gosh, that was a long time ago. And most every state has complete legislative openness, but you can't find out who voted for which bill in a in a committee in Kansas. And and now we're on the floor. Well, what well, about all will. these websites that tell you how people voted on every issue? I see well, those can, all the time. That's the final vote. But the business, you know, the business that's done in the committee so determines what's going to come out on the floor. So does and, that matter? Oh my gosh! I believe it. If you know how they you can't 20, hold anybody accountable if you don't know how they're. Because, well, you know how they voted on the. No, final sometimes document. people vote yes in committee and, and get out no. to the floor yeah. and say no. <laughs> but Mike, it's not just Kansas. Kansas is bad, no question about it. So are most states, and the federal government is worse than any of them. Yeah. All right. Speaking of the closing. federal government, it closed down <laughs> last week for a few hours, then reopened after Congress agreed to keep the government fully funded giving the House and Senate more time to craft a final budget bill. The funding deal also adds billions of dollars to the future budget over the next two years, about half for the military, the other half for domestic programs. A lot of Republicans were unhappy with the spending agreement that adds a few zeros to the deficit and the debt. So, Steve, why do Republicans keep telling voters they will cut spending if they're elected, but once again, after being elected, have agreed to do just the opposite. Well, two reasons. One is because they're just blatantly dishonest. The other is because they want to, they, they want to get reelected, and they know that, quite frankly, despite all these things people say about how they want to cut budgets and so forth and so on, nobody wants their stuff cut, okay? Mm -hmm. And this goes for conservatives and Republicans as well as liberals and Democrats. I'm not blaming any group of people. What I'm saying is it's easy when you're running for office to say, I oppose the burgeoning debt. And then when you get in there, when somebody says, well, but what about, what about what's coming to me? Then you give them what they want. I am, I am absolutely disgusted. I really actually now call myself more an independent than anything else. I tend to vote for more Republicans only because 
They're going to do less damage, in my view, than the Democrats. This budget deal, for example, okay, is one of the worst things in history that I have ever seen. We have a debt that is incredibly high, getting higher, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and yet, unless, unless, until we start cutting spending, we are but essentially. But Steve, doomed. you're a West Point graduate, and this adds money to the military budget. I don't. You know, I don't care about that. The military needs to be rebuilt, not at the expense of everything else. And secondly, the military is amongst the highest in terms of waste, fraud, and abuse of anybody else. Their budgets can also be From cut. From a technological standpoint, we can put more money into the budget for the military. That's what we need to look at. $4.4 trillion that they put into uh, this budget, $7 trillion overall. EPA cut by 25%. Small business, the administration of small business, cut by 25%. They even cut Meals on Wheels again, <laughs> transportation by 18%. Well, Look at all these wrecks we continue to see uh, with our train system, and they cut but, it but by But these 18. are all proposals. The final budget has not yes, yes, been yes, achieved. Yes, and yes, I would yes, point out, yes, Crosby, uh, that... Uh, Republicans in the Senate don't have 60 votes, and you can't get anything done unless you get 60 votes to proceed right. to debate a bill, and so Republicans have to depend well, on support it's from the a Democrats. compromise, which means we're, we're going to end up with these, uh, we're not going to have a real That's budget. why it's military right. and domestic spending. Yeah. And, you know, and they all, the, the, the Republicans, the Democrats, the White House all hired the mafia's accountant, Rosie Scenario. <laughs> um, and, and none of these numbers are real in any way, shape, or form. And I'm, I'm with Steve. I'm disgusted by the whole process. Republicans in char are in charge of all three uh, parts of the, of the government, and we're, and we're ending up with a budget that will send us into Greek-like debt. Um, and so, I'm, I'm not talking so Mary, about Plato and Aristotle. Mary, is this good news for the Democrats? What? The fact that uh, these people are sitting around criticizing the Republicans and they <laughs> well, can, the charge. Democrats I mean, can go out and say... What happens is your responsibility. And what happens is, is taking place because of this massive tax cut. And you have to pay for it somehow. And well, so they're not guess, paying for it with this piece well, oh, of yes, legislation. You are. You're paying for it by what the New York Times calls the most incredibly severe transfer of wealth from lower income Americans to higher income They say Americans. that about every budget no, no, crafted they don't by say Republicans. That about yes, budget. they do. No, no. When you have to cut, you're going to deliver boxes of food for food stamps. Well, that's oh, just a proposel, God. Mary. That's How not a fait accompli. The transfer of wealth is, is because of wealth? The, 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 the people at the, the very top the get a... Huge, ta I mean, amazing about. Well, they pay the bulk of the taxes. Do you know during the Obama still administration? Pay eighty percent of the taxes. Yeah. Do you know during the Obama administration, the tax cut that you got thin is better for middle class in oh, uh, and lower Terry. income people. No, no, making no, stuff up. No, no, dude, this, this is making it up. Yes, it is. Uh, it is just uh, I've got two hundred dollars. I got to get more. you to hold on, it's and we're down to thirty seconds, Steve. Is DACA going to be resolved before March the fifth? Deferred you know, action on childhood I, th I, think, I think it probably will because, again, the Republicans that I voted for are all going to cave in like they always do. You and agree? it'll be a horrible You're have deal. a DACA agreement? I, I think there might be. I think his question is, will Trump agree to it? Yeah. Uh, will yes, Democrats uh, go along with his four proposals that he has to have to go along with a DACA um, deal? If push comes to shove, I suppose they will. Hmm. All yes. right. Now we head to the soapbox for roast and toast where the Ruckets have 30, let me repeat that, 30 seconds each to adore or deplore people and events in the news. And we start with Mary. Well, I adore uh, Mr. Jamal, Syed Jamal, the chemistry professor from, uh, from Lawrence who has uh, undergone incredible trauma being, being uh, uh, arrested in his front yard. And I... You know, we all know the story you now because it's so important uh, to our to our area and to our spirit, so to speak. Uh, thank you to everybody who has helped him uh, online, everybody who has helped his family, and we hope that you get a favorable ruling and can return to your family from the immigration police, Mr. Terry. Jamal. Um, I just, I had one, and, and it was uh, a black history fact, but I'll do it uh, later. I want to congratulate Not on the, this program. The, fir the first, no, the <laughs> first, running out of time. the first responders, uh, Broward County. Uh, some of my friends are on the city council down there, county commissioners, and I, I, I just want to thank them for getting out there quickly uh, and dealing with this issue of guns that America will not deal with. All right, Steve. 
I'm roasting world-renowned theologian Joy Behar, the blathering <laughs> behemoth of buffoonery, for mocking <laughs> Vice President Pence by saying that Christians who say that God speaks to them must be mentally ill. Behar is such an ignorant bigot that she apparently doesn't realize that she's also mocking over a billion Jews, Hindus, and Muslims, including the Prophet Muhammad, all of whom spoke with God. Here's a short list of the other mentally ill God speakers. Abraham, Moses, the Virgin Mary, Mother Teresa, and Gandhi. A word of warning, Joy, mocking the Prophet Muhammad could bring down a fatwa on your grotesquely large head. All right, Crosby. Whoa. Yeah, oh. uh, mm. no, no misogyny on so this show. I'd, I'd like to, How to that misogyny? Ro roast the uh, majority of the city council <laughs> voted 10 to 2 to override the 8th in a series of majority votes against streetcars and light rail, showing not just a, a, an undemocratic attitude, but an actually a contempt for democracy. And finally, you'll like this, uh, Crosby. It's about a book, a toast to Howard Kurtz for his new book, Media Madness detailing the stormy relationship between President Trump and news organizations. Kurtz is media critic at Fox News after stints at CNN and The Washington Post. Kurtz treats both sides fairly, in my opinion, and includes the book with this warning. Donald Trump will not be president forever, but the media's reputation, badly scarred during these polarizing years, might never recover. I fully agree with what Mr. Kurtz said. And that is Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. And now for the Ruckettes and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.